So welcome everybody and thank you for coming to another conversation in our series uh, Adapting for an Uncertain Future and I'm delighted today to be joined by Zoe Blackler. Um, Zoe is, um, has been for many years an investigative uh, journalist, uh, worked a lot in the media, she's published in The Guardian, The New York Times, loads of other places and then um, turned activist. So I want to I want to ask you about that. Um, I'm all, I have so many questions for you um, uh, about Kairos, the uh, the club and event space and idea that you set up last year, um, and so many questions about other things. And um, yeah, so thank you so much, Zoe, for making the time uh, to come along today. Well, thank you very much for asking me. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, yeah, so perhaps start. Can you start with uh, your 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 kind of story in a nutshell of of where your career started and then why you kind of left journalism? Yeah, sure. I mean, firstly, just to say, since I set up Kairos, everything has been in person. I think this is only the second Zoom call I've had in maybe six months. Wonderful. I'm readjusting to how weird this is, rather than being in a room full of all you lovely faces and lovely people. Um, yeah, so my, my background was that I was a journalist for many years and I was moving increasingly towards doing investigations. And then on the, the sort of the edge of investigation starts to move into, I mean, I've always done campaigning, but the more you get into investigations, the more you kind of, I was moving towards doing campaigning work for charities, that kind of stuff, and moving away from this idea of news journalism and more into uh, doing work that feeds into campaigns. Um, and I was between projects and thinking of what to do. I'd been applying for jobs at Global Witness, that kind of stuff. And then I met somebody at a party and he said, and he was full of covered in exile banners. And he said, I think he must've just been at the bridges. And he said, um, check them out. They're really good. It's really interesting. You should uh, go and, um, oh, there's a face I recognize. Hi, Justine. Um, and so I went home and I Googled them and I watched um, Gail's talk, Heading to Extinction. And at that time it was very straightforward. It was just her in her kitchen or her sitting room, just talking through the curves. And um, it had a real impact on me. And I realized I the time had come to stop sort of being a journalist, standing on the outside, looking in, reporting on stuff from the outside and actually being part of the, the story. And um, and then it took me a while to get into exile because it's very hard to penetrate, at least it was at that time. But then I found myself on the media team within a few weeks and spent the next two and a half years working on the trials. Um, so doing the media work around all the trials of which there have been hundreds and hundreds. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, can you talk a bit about the media? I, I listened to a really good interview you did about a year ago on Tipping Point. Um, about the, you know, the power of the media and uh, so many people I speak to are just shocked and horrified at the mainstream media's response to the climate and ecological emergency and, um, yeah, I mean, talk a bit, particularly about how you see that shifting, if you do see it shifting now. Yeah. I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is that since I've set up Kairos, it has been about providing an alternative space for alternative conversations. <laughs> and so I'm probably, and I'm not doing the media work for XR anymore. So I'm much less engaged. When I was in XR, I was on that front line all the time, following what was being written, following the debates, and I'm doing it less so just out of sheer frustration and exhaustion. And um, so I'm, I'm not 100% following everything that's happening in the way that perhaps I was a few or a year or so ago. Um, uh, it's still a massive problem. It's still a massive problem. It's reported much more now. So when after April 2019, there was a massive shift that um, XR, Greta Thunberg, Fridays for Future, there was a real shift then at that point and the media started doing a better job than it had done before but it's still completely inadequate and in some ways I would think it's actually worse in some ways because they the BBC which is where I get a lot of I do still watch the BBC even though it drives me crazy um they will do a story about a new report that's come out saying this is the last chance for humanity 
and then they'll go straight into another item that's about the football or something else. And in a way, what it's saying is, look, there's this existential crisis, but don't worry about it because we're still behaving as if everything's normal. Yeah. And, and in some ways, I worry that it's actually worse. And you turn yeah. on the radio, it's climate everywhere, climate everywhere. But I think we're at this point now where uh, it's still the media still catching up and identifying the problem without really engaging with the severity of it and really engaging with the um, the fact that the solutions are not techno fixes, that it's something yeah. much more fundamental and they still haven't got to that yet. And I, I think part of it is perhaps that a lot of the people who work in the media have no idea. And part of it is that uh, the rules of the rules of the way that news is reported are, are getting in the way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I watched Planet Critical, the latest Planet Critical this morning, and she was interviewing, uh, Rachel was interviewing somebody called Lucy McAllister at the uh, Denison University in the States. And they've just done a huge research study on mainstream media in five Anglophone countries. And um, yeah, the results were that it's much better at reporting the science, as you say, but still crap <laughs> at, um, kind of talking about the implications of it and, and connecting the dots and so on. Um, so can you say more about these rules that you spoke of in the mainstream media? You know, is, is there a conspiracy going on or is it just the kind of business as usual um, drag? I mean, I don't know, I can't really say. Certainly the media is owned by a small number of people with vested interests. But how much of it is a conscious attempt to go win? We don't want to raise awareness of this issue because we've all got our bunkers in New Zealand. We think it's going to be fine. And how much it's just part of the culture of reporting. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't possibly say, but certainly I think we're all, I would say, aware that if you've got an interest in the status quo, you're less likely and less open to looking at alternatives and looking at what's wrong with it. And certainly the people who run the media have vested interest in the status quo and that could be some of it. I mean, Steve Toos, who was also on that podcast, takes a more, more robust line and thinks there's some, it's much more overt. I haven't seen that. I don't know, I've never worked for the Murdoch Press, but, um, well, actually that's not entirely true, but it was a very brief stint. Um, so I, yeah, I, I, I can't say that it's an overt attempt to avoid it, but, one, it's vested interest. Two, when you're trained to be a journalist, you're trained to have an idea about what a news story is. And um, I think one of the examples that I gave in that podcast was that I was talking to somebody after one of the a result came through for a trial, and I was talking to a journalist, and I was saying, "Can you can you write about this? It was an acquittal or something." And um, she said, "Oh, but it's a really busy time because there's another party in Downing Street's just emerged and there's stuff going on." And I said, "Yeah, but you know, it's the end of the world." <laughs> and she said, "Yeah, but it's been going on for a very long time, the end of the world." And there is something like a, about the culture of journalism that you need you need distinct, discrete events, and you need something new, and you need something different. And every time we did another rebellion, it was all. Well, is it going to be bigger? Is it going to be spicier? Is it there's a trajectory of things that are meant to follow? Um, so yeah, so that that's a really big yeah. problem. Yeah. And you spoke about um, well, want to get on to Kairos and, and why you set that up last year. Um, and you said you kind of uh, stepped back from XR now, and you talked about but earlier about your frustration. Um, yeah, what led to that kind of shift I guess you know why aren't you still wholly involved with XR oh it's nothing I mean it's not a, a big rejection of XR it's that I'd done it for quite a long time now and having had having been involved in that first big shift um it felt like all the gains were quite small and piecemeal and things were moving very slowly but it was as much a personal well, two things. One, a personal frustration for me that everywhere that I was going to get my information about the world seemed to be stuck in some very outdated idea of what's happening in the world and where we're going. And I would go to, say, the LRB or the Hay Festival looking for analysis about, you know, a, a, 
some interpretation of the world around me. And it seemed like um, all the conversations that were being had weren't taking into consideration the major issue, which is the implications of the situation that we're in and where we're heading. Mm -hmm. So partly it was just my personal frustration of thinking, well, I want to find a space where I can bring those voices in and have those conversations. Um, but also I think it's, you find your role in this work, don't you? And I did Exile for quite a long time, but it feels like Kairos is more mm. the right role for me. It's, it, mm. yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's move on to that. So uh, I love the name. Tell us what the name means. There's two types of time, two, two, two words in ancient Greek for time. There's chronos and there's kairos. And chronos is chronological time. It's, um, it, it's measured in, dis, in, in particular, uh, you know, um, segments. Um, kairos is much more qualitative and it waxes and wanes and a kairotic moment is a moment of significance. So um, it just felt like this moment that we're in is one of those chirotic moments mm -hmm. where we have an incredible opportunity to do something. It's a great challenge. Um, it's a great opportunity, but it's also very fleeting, um, but also incredibly significant. This is a very significant time for us. And, uh, and I tried, I, I came across it in a quote and I thought it was really apt. And then I thought, oh, but it's really pretentious. I can't name it after an ancient Greek word. And I tried to get away from it, but it just stuck. Um, I couldn't just let it go. And actually what's been so interesting is it really resonates with people. And I keep coming across it. There was a piece in The Guardian somebody sent to me the other day of a writer in America who writes writing about time and she talks about Kronos and Kairos and how uh, Kronos has taken over our understanding of time and we need to re-engage with Kairos. And several write, um, speakers have come as well and they've talked about Kairos. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely been the right name, I think, thankfully. Yeah, yeah. And do you know what I particularly love about your website? Um, I mean, as well as the whole idea, but is the questions you ask on there. And people, if you haven't seen the website, go check it out. It's just, uh, you've listed like hundreds, I think, of questions that we should all be reflecting on and addressing right now. And I, I just, uh, I, I kind of, when I first read them, it was like, yes. <laughs> Um, so, so Kairos is a, is, a, is a physical space, it's a club, uh, it's a, a place that hosts events. Um, what else is it? Or how, how would you sum it up, what it is? Um, uh, the, well, the tagline is it's a, it's a new event space for, to explore the social and cultural consequences of the climate and nature crises. Um, so yeah, it, it's a physical space. So I, after all those years of doing Zoom calls and the lockdown, I just craved to be in a physical space with other people. So that's the first thing. Um, the, the idea was to create a space where there was a different worldview, where you walk into this space and the level of conversation is up here. I got very tired of trying to convince people that um, to come and join me up here. And I thought, right, I want to create a space where everybody who walks in the door has sort of already got a level of awareness. You talked earlier about um, your community being collapse aware. And, and it's that, it's having a sort of a shared understanding of, of where we are in the world and creating space for that alternative worldview. Because the, me the mainstream media isn't expressing that worldview. We're in a minority in the mainstream. So I wanted to create a space where we were the majority. It was our space. And rather than wasting time, uh, and in fact, the day after we launched, I heard Kate Rayworth on the Today programme, and it was about degrowth. And she had literally a minute or something to talk about degrowth. And she was totally on the, on the back foot, not on the back foot, on the defensive, because they were saying, right, you've got a minute to explain what you mean, and but blah, 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 and arguing with her. And I thought if she'd have come to Kairos, we would have given her 45 minutes. We would have had a much more interesting conversation rather than have this kind of back and forth and yes, but no, but it would have been like, okay, well that's taken as given that we need degrowth. Then what's the, com where does the conversation go from there? Um, and to me, that just felt really 
lacking a space like that to have those kinds of conversations. And there are people around doing really interesting work, but they're doing it in the universities, they're doing it in some parts of the independent media, they're doing it in, in activist spaces, they're doing it in places, they're doing it online. But to have a place where those people could come and meet and together in a physical space, and also in a very selfish way of like, rather than me having to go out and watch Zoom, uh, watch things on YouTube, which I find quite dispiriting to actually be in a physical space and bring people into my physical space. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the events um, aspect of it. And then I decided to make a members club, but not like any other members club that you would think of, as a way of reinforcing that culture. Because um, I, in order to maintain a space that has a particular worldview, there has to be a shared understanding and there has to be a shared culture. And I thought, well, if you make it a members club, then in some ways I could do two things. I could have the open events that anybody could come, but then in time as the membership grows to have more uh, smaller closed events that are just for our community. Because the main, and it hasn't been a problem, but before I started, I thought one of the main challenges would be how do I establish the culture? And actually it hasn't been a challenge because it's the people who come have created that culture. Mm -hmm. That was the response to it, yeah. And then, and then there's a third level to the work, which I'm just starting now which is um, to do more, to use that space to do more output focused work. So the open events are really just come and let's talk and there's no agenda. We're not trying to achieve anything. It's just a space for to have these conversations, to air some of these ideas, to talk about them, to be together, to create community. Um, but, but I'd also like to have another strand to it, which is about let's bring people together from different worlds to collaborate together and to have some kind of concrete output for it. So we had our first one two weeks ago, um, which was, there was a Colombian lawyer here who's done a lot of work on rights of nature and he did a talk in the evening. And then the next day, a group of people, some lawyers, some others, um, came together at Kairos and talked about what it would what what would it involve to get rights of nature into law in the UK and we decided to keep it quite loose so uh, Cesar the Colombian lawyer spoke and then we had a session where everybody just said what they were doing it was so interesting all these a dozen different people doing different bits of work in different parts of in different areas um, all of it really different and then in the final section it was well, well where, where, where to go from this and they came away from it with a whole bunch of ideas of where they could go together one of them was and I think the main one was why have we never been in a room together mm -hmm. and we need to create a network of people working on rights of nature and that's what's come out of that workshop so that made me very happy yeah fantastic Thank you. So I've just got uh, one more question and then we'll throw it open. So people um, start to think about what you might want to ask or observe um, of Zoe. And um, I actually can see you all on one screen. So, so um, uh, when we get to that part, you can either type it in the chat or you can raise your hand and, and then unmute yourself. So, um, yeah, Zoe, can you, um, a lot of what we do in heart is about psychological and emotional uh, resilience, um, because I think this is a, 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 one could say actually a spiritual crisis in many ways and, and involves us um, really thinking deeply about who we are and what, what it's all about and, and what does a good life look like and, and um, and the importance of community and so on. Can you talk a bit about your, your own emotional journey through all of this and, and where you are, where you are now? Uh, do you mean engaging with the potential of collapse or do you mean with Kairos or do you mean a bit of everything? Yeah, well, wherever you want to go really. And, and you know, I didn't want to kind of assume what you were what you were assuming <laughs> yeah. um but well, yeah I, yeah okay What's that journey been like emotionally and psychologically yeah. I mean so I started Kairos because I was at a very low point emotionally 
having done all that stuff with XR for years and feeling like and being having to engage with the media all the time it's really hard work and the lockdown and then oh uh, there was somebody in the states who set fire to himself an activist set fire to himself and I don't know it just it really hit me of what is it that we're doing what am I doing where are we going how how am I going to give myself some personal resilience because I'm worn out and worn down and this space felt like for me a personal answer and uh and I suppose what's been so interesting is that I set it up because I was driven by an emotional need for this space and this community and I sort of assumed that if I was feeling that there were lots of other people who were too and it's been totally borne out by what's happened and the response that I've had people who come to the space so so that was my the 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 emotional need to initially to set up courage but I suppose on the broader level on the, the broader answer um how do we deal with what we know is happening how do we deal with the fact that we're watching it unfold and the changes aren't being made that need to be made how do we deal with the fact that climate crisis is locked in and even though we might not feel it all the time or I shouldn't speak for I, I should speak personally shouldn't I I don't feel it all the time but there are moments when I uh, when I really engage and I understand what's coming and uh, I think I'm I've got a foot in both I've got half of me just wants to go and live on a hill and and build community and be prepared for what's coming but I still need to keep doing I still need to keep acting and that's it isn't it it's sort of the uh the healing that comes from acting I think is really important yeah yeah are you familiar with um Rupert Reed's uh three scenarios dodo phoenix and butterfly no Oh, okay. Well, some of the others of you might be interested as well. We, we often talk about it in our webinars and our talks and our live chats with people. But so, so he sees three potential scenarios now for our future. Uh, the first is Dodo, which kind of speaks for itself. The second is Phoenix, you know, rising from the ashes, that this civilization has to collapse, but then we may be able to build something, who knows, better out of the ashes of that but it, it necessitates collapse for that to happen. And then the third scenario, butterfly, which is where we can perhaps transform radically from within this society, this civilization, um, without the necessity of collapse. Um, so one of the things I do in my talks often is get people to, you know, go and stand in the, <laughs> and of course, nobody knows exactly, but it's interesting how people's responses to that has shifted even over the last year. Um, you know, we're getting many, many more people standing in uh, dodo or phoenix rather than butterfly. So, so where where are you? Or does it does it shift? Does it change? Um, God, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. How do we know? How do we know? I think I'm as time passes I'm losing less faith that we can do what needs to be done um but I suppose for me and what I'm doing at Kairos it's about trying to I, you know it's about looking at how we think about it yeah um, that that seems to be a really fundamental part of this is the the kind of things that Dougal Hine writes about which is that we have an idea of where we think we're going to and this place doesn't exist yeah how do we imagine a different place that we might be heading towards yeah and that takes many different forms and lots of people come and speak at Kairos with very different visions of what that alternative future is and I mean there's lots of there are a lot of possibilities so I, I don't know I, I maybe I'm just too busy to fully engage with with exactly where I yeah 
with yeah. you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> and, and I wasn't kind of suggesting it was even desirable to kind of put yourself in one of those three camps. Um, I, I, I shift um, and, and I think it's really important, as you say, to remain open to the possibilities in this chirotic moment. Yeah, um, I think the chance of butterfly is, is rapidly diminishing and um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very, very much. So lovely people on the call. Um, what would you like to ask or say? So just stick your hand up and unmute yourself. <clears throat> what are you curious about? Yeah, Jane. Um, hi, Zoe. Thank you. I, you have, I just, just, I so want to be involved in Kairos. Um, but I'm 70 years old with chronic fatigue and I live in the forest of Dean. And so, <laughs> so I can't basically. Oh. Um, and I'm, I think that's all just, uh, I've, I've looked, had a quick look at the site. There's no way I could possibly afford to be a part of it. Um, and uh, I don't know, I'm realising that I shouldn't really have opened my mouth. What I'm feeling is a little bit left out, actually, because I just love what you've spoken about, and I'm just wishing that I lived in London now. <laughs> which I've never done before. <laughs> People do occasionally write to me and say, are you going to record this? Well, and mm. I made a decision really early on not to do any recording. And I just wanted it to be a space where people came and felt comfortable being in the space and didn't think there's a camera hanging around and am I going to appear on someone's social media somewhere? And equally, I've been, I've been, I tell people when they come, they can't use their phones. It's so hard getting people off their phones, but it feels really important. And we had, there was one evening where these two young artists came, they'd come with someone who comes a lot, but they'd not been before. And they'd been told not to use their phones, but I think they just thought, well, they were young, they just thought for phone calls. So they're sitting there and they're both doing whatever they're doing on their phones. And I went up to them and I said, guys, no phones. And they said, oh, really? What, really, no phones? Oh, okay then. I said, well, look, why don't you go and talk? In, in, put your phones down, you can go and talk to Jenny. Jenny's sitting over there on her own going. And so they got up and they went and talked to this lovely woman and, and a conversation came about. So, um, yeah, so that's just to say, sorry. Um, sorry if you're feeling left out, but yeah. um, keeping it in person and keeping it located and grounded is really, central to the project yeah no thank you i hear you i hear you very much maybe jane you could set up a mini kairos in the forest of dean i to be honest i, I you know i'm at the moment i'm in the middle of um uh, delivering leaflets and the things because of the upcoming election because i think the green party are the uh, other people that might make some kind of a difference um and and I grow my own veg in my garden and it's there's just there's no it's not that there's no time for me anymore it's that with the chronic fatigue there is no energy left I can't I can't do something like that yeah. so I just have to talk about things like that um and hope that someone else thinks that it's a good idea <laughs> well I mean one thing I will say is that um if you look at the past events a section on the website everybody who's spoken i've kept all the details of their talks and increasingly i'm going to start posting stuff whether it's links to sites or out, or things that have come out of events we did a workshop and every donut economics workshop and everyone wrote on questions on bits of paper and one of these days when i've got a minute i'm going to type them all up and put them on and it's really interesting all the questions that people are asking yeah. um we did the event that we did over the weekend was a giant comic book drawing weekend which was really sweet and people have done instagram stories based on pictures that they took of the i made a i allow people to use their phones for photographs for um just one weekend only because they did pick pictures of the comics and i've actually made a comic a long comic about the story of food at kairos based on people's drawings so there is going to be stuff there so it might if you go and have a look at past events it might spark an interest to go and research somebody that you might not have heard of before 
or yeah. yeah yeah fab thank you jane who else I'd just love to make um, a comment, Zoe. Um, something that I really love um, with your site and your ethos is the fact that you've got a section that says people that you would love to have speak. And I think that's quite un unusual and powerful because I don't know if these are people that you're already in conversation with, so you know they're going to, or if it's a bit of a kind of a, a nudge, like, come on, we've got our eye on you. Um, but either way, I just thought that's really nice. It, it wasn't a, here's who's, well, I didn't read it as here's who's coming up. I read it as here are some people that we're hoping that we'll have here. And I just thought that's really, that's nice. I like that, I thought that was interesting. So I don't know whether there's any, strategic behind that or but well the truth curious. the truth of that is that basically the site for a long time we've just it's just been redesigned by charlie who does the design work and it's uh, i think it looks really beautiful but when i very first started i literally just whacked up the pdf that i was sending to someone who said they might fund me i just wrote seven pages and sent it out and one of the things was just to give people an indication of what before we opened what it might look like and who might go there I just wrote a section of these are the kind of people and, yeah. and then I did a section of these are the kind of things that we're going to talk about and then the website just really became that and yeah. some people said oh it's far too long all this stuff I was like no 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 but I really want it there because so many people responded exactly as you did to that of okay I understand what this project is based on the questions and based on the people and then actually it, it needs a bit of updating because I've come across so many more people now that need to go in that list that I need to put some work into it. I just haven't had time. But also somebody wrote to me going, ha, 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 someone I, who I do want to come and speak, saying, oh, look, you should sort of use that as a way of sort of flattering people into coming or whatever. So I yeah. think it needs a bit of work, but. Um, yeah, oh, okay. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense then. I can understand why that would form part of the pitch document for funding, but it also really makes sense as a way of saying, hey, we, we, we want you, you know, and it's sort of, yeah, so that's, I think it ticks a few boxes, doesn't it? Yeah, then? I need to make more of the second, though. I need to really put start putting people in there who I do actually want to cut, because oh, there are a lot of people on my wish list that aren't in there yet, so. Mm -hmm. There's your nudge then, <laughs> another nudge. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chantal. Yeah, Jilly. Hi, thank you, Zoe, so interesting. Um, I'm a divergent thinker, very right-brained, and I love that nature of what Kairos is offering because you don't know what's going to come out of it, do you? It's, it's alchemy in a way, putting together lots of different people with starting from that same worldview as you describe. And let's see what happens. And I find that uh, quite inspirational. And I wanted to ask you, how do you promote Kairos? Because how do you, and that's sort of linked in also to a supplementary question of, you know, how you how do you fund it? Are you as a way of keeping it going? You know, do you need lots more people to come on in? Have you got space for them? I, I don't know, not having been. Um word of mouth really. I oh. that's how it's been so far, and I I need to look at that again, but I haven't actually done much marketing, which is a word I hate, but anyway, I haven't done much of that. I so it was really just I having been in exile for a long time and having been in the media team, I just knew a lot of people and people who've been mm. through XR and gone off and done other things yeah. um, and people around the edges. So when I, when we opened, I just posted it in a bunch of chats and asked people to spread it. And then we've been building the newsletter list. So and then people come and they have a good time and they tell their friends and other people come. So that's how mm. it's how it's grown so far. I would like to have much more awareness of it, not because I necessarily measure success by numbers, but because I feel there's a lot of people who would really, who are out there who are doing interesting work that I'd like them to come and tell us about what they're doing or because mm -hmm. they might appreciate being in that space and get benefit from it. So mm -hmm. it's really reaching the right people in lots of, you know, all the nooks and crannies of where the right people are rather than reaching a lot of people. In terms of funding, I was really lucky. I 
went to an event in the summer. It was a festival. Um, I'm sure you all know Perspectiva. I went to the Realization Festival uh, because a friend of mine was doing the admin and the cooking for it. And she said, come along to this. And I looked at their website and I thought, I don't really understand what this is, but it looks kind of intriguing and I'll, I'll go. And I was very lucky to meet somebody there who then made the funding happen for me. For mm -hmm. so I've got a startup grant for the first year. I don't know what's going to happen in year two. I need to find, uh, they won't fund, they won't be the sole funder in year two, so I need to find some more funding. But the events do bring in a bit of income and I've been very lucky to have cheap spaces so far. Mm. But um, that's the biggest challenge is finding space in central London that is sure. remotely affordable. So it's all very precarious. Mm. Mm. Yes, I, I've involved with XR. I found the Quakers very supportive and, and very reasonably priced. I don't know if that helped. Oh, but uh, okay. yes, so, oh, oh, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, who knows? Well, actually, I'm love it. Say the Quakers, it's where we are now. It's the, it's the Unitarians uh -huh. who are giving us a space for peppercorn rent. Um, but they have their own plans for it. So um, mm -hmm. can't be there forever. There's a, there's a nice Quaker meeting house quite near Euston, I think, if you ever wanted to check that out. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Thank you, Julie. Um, yeah. I love the, um, you know, my, my main thread uh, these days is helping, supporting people in discovering uh, what, is, what is mine to do. <laughs> What is theirs to do and like you were saying earlier you know that we all have a different path in this uh and i just really get a sense from you that you know kairos is your yours to do at least for the moment but that it, it's kind of that sweet spot between things that you um that light you up uh, and also what the world needs um and your strengths and skills you know from from your previous life as it were so that's really fantastic. Mm. Yeah, Kathy. Hi, Zoe. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I've done one of Kimberly's courses, and and I I know what is mine to do, but I'm still drumming up courage to do it. But I I'm doing a lot of research in the in the process. Well, I don't know about doing a lot, but I am researching in the process. Um, and my interest is in the sort of concept of personal transformation and and that is coming from the heart and not from the brain you know let the heart guide and not the brain guide sort of thing um <clears throat> and i want to set up a blog but as i'm still very nervous about it um so my question was um within your couple of years at sort of um organizational level in XR and now with Kairos do you have did you have and do you have any representatives from churches I mean I know uh, I'm out of touch actually but um, four or five years ago that there, there were environmental standards um, that were being promoted within church buildings and stuff and 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 people were aware of their personal you know recycle bit and all that and and uh quakers as an example which which i am um were the only um church to to sign up to the canterbury commitment of 2011 so i'm just curious whether mainstream churches or, or any church actually has in your experience um signed up to this you know is anyone actually recognizing it is more about collapse rather than just recycling your plastic church communities are certainly on my to-do list in terms of outreach um as I say, we are housed by the Unitarians who are very active in this mm. space. Um, I, who else have we had? XR Jews have been in. Um, I'd like to do more around, I want to do an event around Shabbat and the meaning of rest. 
I personally think there is a lot to be learned from the religious traditions and I come from mm. a completely atheist background and I'm very left brain and um, words and books and you know that's where I come from but in the process of doing this I've realized how important or I've engaged with the importance of the personal in it and so there's a whole strand of our events that are about that are about oh, grief good. and questioning and how do we how do we engage with consumerism it's not enough to say for example just stop shopping or well, why mm. do we feel so much need to go and consume what what is it that it's fulfilling enough and we had in fact the first person who spoke on the opening night is Carmody Gray who's a theologian who comes from a Catholic tradition and she talked she's amazing and she talked about uh, your god is what you worship and our society worships consumerism and uh, so I think those big questions that religions ask are really key and need to be part of the conversation. I don't know about the churches per se, but certainly the questions. And also the idea of ritual, and ritual has come from mm. our religious traditions, hasn't it? And we don't really have ritual in our mm. society, or the rituals that we had are not helpful ones. <laughs> And so that seems really, I mean, my background before I was a journalist, I did a master's in anthropology. So that sort of colors my entire view of everything. And and the role of ritual seems to be really important. Mm. But because I grew up in a secular tradition and I, I don't have a faith, um, it feels like there isn't the equivalent in secular life. So that's a rather rambly response to your question, but. Well, it's a great ramble. Thank you. I, I, I just think, um, you know, like I, I'm an interfaith, I was an interfaith minister, but I don't practice anymore. And um, the thing I learned through that extensive training was was about experiencing, which is, in your words, our ritual, you know, the same thing. Um, and, and I think it's really hard. I mean, I struggled um for over half of my life to to accept that I might be something more than just my ability to reason if you know what I mean and and my need to conform you know get the house get the car get whatever um and and it it, it is the experience of oneself this is my experience the I I've moved because of the experience of myself in ritual in ceremony and how it just I realized I had a whole almost a whole half of me you know that that had never really been alive and and I, I stress it because my when I get down I, I go to a few places for my hope and and that is you know the, the British public particularly you know they give millions um to all these um refugee crisis climate problems you know around the world war ukraine whatever and every minute of the day because of the um you know of the planet that you know people are awake when we're asleep sort of thing um there are from all sorts of different traditions and faiths there are people praying or meditating and, and 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 there are a vast number of people doing this, and I think they actually hold Gaia in place. I I think they, you know, their their loving energy is is sustaining in some way. It gives to her. Um, and yet, like you, um, we've discussed, um, the media, you know, doesn't cover much or anything, and I just don't hear the churches at all talking about this anymore. You know, um, the Church of England is rather more concerned about its lack of funds, but it, it, its investment program was in weapons. I don't know if it still is, but it was, you know, so it's kind of like. Um, I don't think the congregations maybe know of all this. I, I think. And yet, if you can't show your heart and your concern in a. What is meant to be a loving environment, which is a congregational meeting I don't know where we can show it really um so I, I just think 
I don't think the churches are essential to, 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 to this change, but I think they are a part of it. And thank you for letting me know about Carmody Greek Grey. She's and wonderful. what's and what's happening you know in your experience of it it's very helpful thank you i'll shut up <laughs> thank um, you but, but also i was going to say um i mean i can't speak to what's happening in the churches but certainly i as i say i approached kairos initially thinking i want my intellectual nourishment which i was missing but as from the beginning Carmody's opening talk was so much more than just about ways mm -hmm. of thinking it was about ways of feeling and ways of being and every conversation pretty much comes back to the same question which is how do we come together mm -hmm. which was what last weekend was um, on a very tiny little scale about but all these conversations come back to that how do we come back together as people in a society how mm -hmm. do we come together as species on the same planet how do we come together in collective action but it all comes back to that mm -hmm. and I guess that is a religious question isn't it the interconnectedness of life um so that yeah yeah I mean if I may I would say if when you're talking I wouldn't use the word religious I I, I would say you know a heart connection or a loving connection or something you know, or, or humanity connection, because the word religion has put up so many people's backs, you know, most people left the church because they couldn't stand it. Um, and young people have not embraced it. So it, it, it's a religion is a bit of a, you know, a word that turns people off rather than turns people on. <laughs> So which I, is another really good point, which is language and words. Again, mm -hmm. that's something that keeps coming out of conversations at Cairo. Spirituality, religion, mm -hmm. these are words, they carry so much weight, don't mm -hmm. they? But they equally, do. when I describe what the conversations are that we have, I talk about the climate and nature crises. Well, what, what does that mean? I mean, we don't really even have a word. The poly crisis, the meta crisis, the, we don't even have a way of describing what it is that we're going through. And... Mm -hmm. And and we, I think that's such an important part that's missing is mm. what are the words that we're using to describe where we're trying to go. Um, so yeah, that's something else I want to have more conversations about. What, yeah. what we use. Thank you. Uh, if you have an open event, I'll join that one. <laughs> okay, do yeah, please. Thank you, Kathy. thank you. And I just wanted to say to you, Kathy, personally. Uh, feel free to uh, schedule a, um, a conversation with me if you'd like to explore your courage, because I can perhaps help you with that. Um, Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, what else is coming up to the end now? Yes, John. I'd just like to offer a perspective on uh, what you were just talking about, I, I, and particularly the Christian tradition. I think that in, in terms of the churches and the idea of collapse or what we're heading for, um, I think churches have real trouble thinking about this. And I think the reason is that, you know, th there are big resources in the Christian tradition um, for the idea of the end, the idea that we are heading for you know, a, a, an apocalyptic event of some kind, and you can call that the return of Christ or whatever, whatever you mean by that. But the people who believe most strongly in that, particularly uh, uh, are American evangelicals, who are also the same people who deny the reality of climate change by and large, which creates a, a really distorted thinking, you know, and it means that more mainstream Christians or, or people who have a, a more kind of a less intense or, or less focused faith really shy away from that you know that whole idea of of the end you know because it's it's um you know it, it takes them into territory they don't really want to be associated with so i think you know this may be a real problem in terms of 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 a sort of christian understanding um, I just wanted to sort of offer that as a perspective. It's something I've sort of wrestled with quite a bit, but I do think it may be somewhere in the mix as to why churches are, are not really, you know, can't really engage with what we're facing. 
Yeah. Are there, uh, just to ask you all, are there interesting figures that you're aware of from any of the traditions who should, are uh, people I could be bringing into Kairos who are got interesting things to say or particular questions for discussion? Mm -hmm. I mean, specifically on religion and spirituality, but generally mm. also. Mm. I, I, the only person I would have said would be comedy. Uh, I suppose XR Buddhists would be a good place to, mm. to look. Um, Ryan Williams is another. Yeah. He's been very engaged, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Um, Pl Plum Village, um, Thich Nhat Hanh in France, they've just done, they've just started a, can't remember, six week, I think, online course about Zen and saving the planet. Um, so they've written, they're all young people there, mostly. Um, all the nuns and the um, monks are mostly, you know, on 40-ish and under. Um, but they're, they're certainly working on it. Um, and, and there are a couple of good books written by um, Zen Buddhists on, on the climate as well. Um, but um, I, other than Rowan Williams, I can't think of but I'm out of touch, as I said. I, I will put my thinking cap on. If I come up with anyone, I'll let you know. <laughs> There's a lot of what we would call in heart, um, column two. We have, Most people, I think, know what I'm talking about. So column two is, uh, yes, it's real, it's happening, um, but it's kind of we should aim for a future that's business as usual but greener. Um, mm -hmm. that, kind of, that kind of attitude. So I know... You know, and I've been invited to speak at churches um, where they're having like a climate evening um, and, you know, they're often fairly well attended. Um, but it's kind of, yeah, it's that one must not go beyond that column view. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's, it's real, it's happening. We should all do our best, but it's, you know, what was often called the hopium of the bamboo toothbrush. Um, so, yeah, thank you, John. So um, could, could I just say one thing? So um, I also recently within the year, I've learned that apocalypse doesn't mean what the church teaches is it means. Apocalypse means moving of the veil. It's like removing um, an illusion and seeing something different, you know, what the reality is behind. So yeah. it doesn't mean destruction. You know, it, it, it doesn't mean armageddon it 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 means reappraisal transformation it's actually really positive lovely, but... lovely. thank you kathy Ooh. so we're coming to the end um zoe thank you so much this has been very rich uh final question what and you've already said a lot about this but what what kind of insights can you offer about knowing what we know how can we live well now? Oh my God, that's a question, isn't it? I that's... thought, yeah, save the doozy. <laughs> um, I think we've talked about it all, haven't we? I think finding out what, uh, in Dougal's words, like what, what is the work that we all need to do and that, that is the right path for us to take being aware that we aren't going to fix things, but that we're going to damn well do stuff because acting has benefit in its own right. Yeah. And community and coming together. I mean, that seems to be the most important thing for me. I And, and I've said this before, but yes, Kairos is about intellectual nourishment, but it was also really about coming together and being in community. Yeah. And often what I find is, People will, they want an event to come to, but what they really want to do when they get there is talk to people and- Connect, connect. The, yeah, yeah, connect. And on the first couple of evenings, uh, working with a friend of mine who was a cook, we said, well, let's give people food because that will be a nice thing to do to sort of encourage people to come for the first couple of weeks. And then after two weeks, I said, we have to keep feeding people because it's absolutely fundamental. It makes such a difference. And no one else does it. You go out to an event at the Frontline Club, no one's going to give you a bowl of food. And um, she didn't really have the time or the inclination to do it. So I took it on. So I actually, every time we have an event, I cook. 
with 30 odd people. And um, I've been sort of complaining recently going, oh, I've got to shift this to someone else. But actually, I really love it. I love the fact that I'm making food and I'm feeding people that come through the door. And I, I kind of the two things that I want to hold on to are inviting the speakers and organizing what the subjects are going to be and making the food. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the communal aspect of it, how do we how do we find ways to build resilience through community and being together? Um, yeah. That's the well, that's all the well, that's all I've got, I'm afraid. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Fantastic. Zoe, thank you so much. And uh, thank, thank you so much for asking me. And please do come, all of you. Come. I Definitely. definitely. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, good luck with it all. Uh, I will. I look forward to um, yeah meeting you in the flesh, uh, which, as you say, is always so much, so much richer and deeper and more human and more heartfelt. So. And and if any of you've got any ideas of people who that you've come across and thought they're really interested, they've got something really interesting to say or and last weekend we were doing more embodied stuff too. So we were making a big giant comic book together. It was the act of just sitting down and drawing together. And then this lovely woman, Jessie, came and we made a song together out of the comic. Um, so I want to do more of that, too, of sort of the activities that we can do together in the body to come together so again any suggestions that anybody's got i'm just i'm a sponge so okay <laughs> and thank you everybody else for coming along if you'd like to all unmute yourself and say goodbye uh and i will um post the recording of this to you all um thank you lots of love bye everyone. thank you bye thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.